Every time I see her, I fall a little bit in love with Jane McGonagall. (laughs) She's the nicest person ever. Okay, she told you about Herodotus. I want to tell you about the Prussians. This is the Prussian army. The Prussians were getting their asses handed to them by Napoleon. And they determined that the fault lay not with their strategy or their tactics, but with the kind of soldier that they had on the front lines, undisciplined, independent thinkers, farmers with guns. And thus was born the modern school system. In the (laughs) mid-1800s, Massachusetts established the first laws that created mandatory public education using a model developed by the Prussians almost 100 years earlier. And as you might expect from a pedagogy derived from or designed to turn illiterate farmers into regimented soldiers, it relied heavily on drilling and testing. Those ideas are still with us today. The first well-known architect of public schools cut his teeth designing stockades. And this is an example of that thinking. Modern school designers refer to it as a cells and bells architecture. Looked at from our perspective today, we can see that this idea had some flaws. It was based on the notion that everyone could learn at exactly the same rate, graduate at exactly the same time, and because the one thing the Industrial Revolution really needed was millions of workers and millions of consumers. In 1909, Woodrow Wilson clarified this for the New York City School Teachers Association, saying, we want one class of persons to have a liberal education, and we want another class of persons, a very much larger class of necessity, to forego the privileges of a liberal education and fit themselves to perform specific, difficult, manual tasks. It wasn't a conspiracy. They didn't try to hide the fact that they were deliberately squashing the creative spirit. 25 years later, late 40s, Elwood P. Cubberly, (laughs) Elwood P. Cubberly, Dean of Stanford School of Education and Editor-in-Chief of Textbooks at Houghton Mifflin said, Our schools are factories in which the raw products, and he meant children, are to be shaped and fashioned, and it is the business of the school to build its pupils according to the specifications laid down. You know, mandatory schooling was one step in eliminating despicable child labor practices. But in a survey of 500 children taken out of factories and coal mines, 412 of them said they would rather be back at work than in the classroom. (laughs) Over time, the schools have become custodial services charged with keeping children off the streets. And as our country grew to handle the scaling problems and record results, the system relies almost exclusively on tests. Children are codified, tracked, simplified, until the day they graduate, and their lives up to that moment get summarized with a single number, 3.0, maybe 4.0 if you're really smart. And we take this model, and like rabid missionaries, we proselytize it around the world, promoting those same cells and bells experiences as we go. Teacher at a podium, kids at desks, tests, grades, everything, down to the last detail. But this approach to education is fragile. In times of economic crisis, the first budgets that are trimmed are in the schools, in education. First, they cut back on non-essentials like art and music. Then they cut teachers and they increase class sizes. And eventually, they stop buying textbooks and even uh, you know, learning materials, supplies. In times of political crisis, 
In developing nations, the school facilities are often commandeered by insurgents. They're built out of cinder blocks. NGOs build these incredible bunkers targeted by revolutionaries. And after the conflict is resolved, they're the last piece of the social fabric to be rebuilt. And fundamental aspects of the pedagogy are themselves suspect, if not downright harmful. Can we honestly look at a child's painting and call it C plus? <laughs> Can you summarize an entire year of physics understanding as B? What, it, what are we describing? You know, more importantly, what are we saying with that to that child? In the hundred or so years that letter grades have been given, there's not been a single study, not one, that found any positive benefit for the student. The negative effects, on the other hand, are well known. Alfie Kahn uh, has a great summary of the detrimental impact of grades. The relentless use of grades puts the focus on the grade more than the material being studied. Children who are graded quickly learn to choose or optimize for the easiest problem they possibly can. In essence, getting the good grade is the problem they're always trying to solve, regardless of the topic that they're working on. And it's not surprising then to discover that it affects how they think. One of the studies showed that simply telling a child that they're going to be graded causes an immediate reduction in the creative options they analyze when they're presented with a problem. And one of the reasons for this is that the mechanism for learning is a fragile, delicate thing. fMRI and PET scans of volunteers doing various activities show that we receive some of the highest dopamine doses during that aha moment of learning, uh, what Jane calls the epic win moment. Dopamine is, uh, if you're not familiar, is a neurotransmitter produced by your hypothalamus and uh, that makes you feel good. It's that sense of accomplishment, that sense of ah, is one of the, the brain's primary built-in reward mechanisms and is wired up to two really interesting regions of the brain, the basal forebrain and the lateral habenula. And without getting too much deeper into neuroanatomy, let me just say that the basal forebrain is considered to be at the heart of the learning process, it's sort of organizing information. And the lateral habenula is one part of the mechanism for recognizing surprises. And generally, we like learning, and generally, we don't like surprises. But thanks to a really brilliant piece of wiring, when both of these fire at once, we get a triple dose of dopamine. So we really like learning that surprises us. This is, in fact, one of the highest levels of dopamine we can receive naturally. But like many parts of the brain, if we don't exercise this mechanism, if we aren't surprised by what we're learning, it atrophies. And the loss of learning, the atrophy of delight, if you will, leads to apathy. Apathy is the antithesis of innovation and creativity. So we can do better. As a culture, both nationally and globally, we seem to think of school as something sacred. I speak from my own experience when I tell you that suggestions to change things are frequently meant with outcry. But the thing that institutions don't seem to account for is that kids really want to learn. Those brain structures are connected to our pleasure centers for a reason. And to illustrate that, I want to tell you a story that was first told to me by Marco Torres, a teacher at San Fernando High School in California. A story about one of the greatest music teachers in the history of our planet. His name? is fun to. A musician named Jerry C. wrote a new arrangement of Pachelbel's Canon for electric guitar, and he uploaded the tablature to a fairly unknown site. A few weeks later, a kid named fun to downloaded that tablature 
and proceeded to relentlessly practice until he felt good enough to record this video. It's so beautiful. That rock. Eventually, other kids saw his video and started to emulate him and share their works in progress. This is Nazreen working her way through the exact same tablature at three quarter speed. And that's still too hard for some kids. Versions appear played at half speed, like this one from WWH. Now, when I see that, I think I could probably play at least as good as that kid which is precisely what other kids think, and thousands of versions of Pachelbel's canon begin to appear on YouTube. There's growing support in a rapidly forming ad hoc community for sharing progress, and a year later we see that WWH has improved. It's not perfect yet, but better, and they're sharing their progress. Ten months ago, he uploaded this. In my wildest dreams, I'll never be able to play guitar as well as WWH. Now, lest you think I'm stacking the deck, WWH is not unique. There are literally thousands and thousands of children around the world who've picked up instruments ranging from tubas to xylophones and learned to play that version of Pachelbel's canon. Completely peer-to-peer, -peer, mutual supported, self-directed learning with no adults involved. Sorry, WWH. <laughs> Fun 2's video has been seen more than 73 million times. That's more than the population of France. That's 743 years of continuous viewing. Legions of kids around the world teaching themselves and each other how to play music. So, sure, you're thinking, it works for rock and roll, but will it work for anything else? In 1999, Dr. Mitra, a cognitive scientist who had been uh, toying with the idea of unsupervised play, was watching under unsupervised play and computers, was watching kids in a slum, playing at the edge of an old market in New Delhi. And he decided to make the internet available to these unschooled, largely illiterate kids who otherwise had no opportunities to use technology and to make the computer accessible but not theftable. He punched a hole in an abandoned storefront wall and mounted the computer and touchpad about three feet off the ground. He turned it on, set it up to keep the web browser open, and left it for a few months. And when he comes back to check the results, what do you suppose he finds? The kids not only completely mastered the internet, they can now speak English, and they are reading stories to each other off the screen. That's great. Music? English? What about science? While working on Tinkering School, I received an inquiry. Would I like to develop a kit for an annual science fair? And I thought, kits? Anathema. How can you create a great experience in a kit? But then I thought, how can you create a great experience in a kit? And I decided to explore a simple physics topic. We would build and explore potential energy vehicles, basically cars powered by a falling weight. And the instructions include this moment in the process where the kids put hex nuts on the edge of the table and knock them off. You pick them up and you repeat, and every time you pick it up, you're storing energy in the nut, and every time you knock it off, you're releasing it. It's a classic demonstration of potential energy. And there was one shining moment that made this whole experiment worthwhile. In the second group of kids, one girl, she couldn't have been much more than seven or eight, sat there with the hex nut, lifting it up to the edge of the table and knocking it off into the palm of her hand. The other kids are busy assembling their machines and I asked her if she was okay. Yes, she said, I'm just trying to figure this out. So I let her be and I turned back to the kids who were struggling with these terrible kits I'd made. And when I got back to her, she was just lifting the hex nut up and down. How's it going, I asked her. She said, I don't think the energy is stored in the hex nut. And I said, well, where do you think it's being stored? I think, she said, and she paused here, 
trying to figure out like what words to use. I think that gravity is like a stretchy rubber band and when I lift the hex nut up, I'm stretching the rubber band. Here's a seven-year-old struggling with a concept that had Isaac Newton perplexed. What happens, I said, if the rubber band breaks? I suppose, she said, it would just float away. I made this complicated kit, all these instructions, and all I really needed was a hex nut. It turned out that she'd never had a hex nut and she was overjoyed to, that she could take it home. <laughs> that, it, uh, that it took me a week and a half of development on the kits no longer mattered because it had set her up for this epiphany and it led me to this thought. We should stop thinking of education as something that we do to people and start thinking of people as voracious, self-directed learners. You can, as we've learned over the past 150 years, make people study, but you can't make them learn. Children in groups and alone can teach themselves, and yet we have fundamental, largely unquestioned assumptions about public education. What if we threw them all out? Waldorf, Montessori, Reggio Emilia are all well-known alternatives. But what if we went a little further afield and imagined a school with no classes, no structure, no teachers, democratically administered by children? We would end up at something that's referred to as Sudbury. The first Sudbury school was started in 1968 as a place where children could learn at their own pace. And the adults at Sudbury schools are there only to support and facilitate what the kids are doing. Having never attended a class or taken a test by the time they graduate, are these kids prepared for college? Well, yes, as it turns out. On average, more than 80% of them go to college, which is slightly better than the national average for public schools. And on the spectrum of alternative school approaches, Sudbury is pretty far out on the fringe, but there is one step further we could go. Unschooling. Unschooling is the last radical step you can take in a pedagogy. Unschoolers raise their children at home with no pretense to educating them. Now, it's hard to find good solid evidence on these kids yet, but the current consensus among researchers is that about 70% of them graduate from college compared to the 24% that is normal for public school kids. Put another way, nothing is better than public school. It's hard to imagine. Doing nothing is more effective at getting kids through college than 12 years of homework and tests. In fact, recent studies show as homework hours go up, cognition and retention go down. This is not a secret. Wrote a Time Magazine article about it in 2006. Yet, average assigned school homework hours continue to creep up. School days get longer. It's like kids are working at startups. What we're doing in public school is not working that well, and maybe we're doing too much. And unschooling is taking it to the extreme, but maybe there's a middle ground. I'm a little bit behind here, so I'm going to speed up. 1930, superintendent of schools in Manchester noticed that his poorest districts are scoring the lowest on things, on tests, and he tells them to stop teaching math until sixth grade. He decided the problem was there were just too many topics. They were wasting time on it. They wouldn't teach it at all. Kindergarten through fifth grade, no math, counting yes, but no multiplication, no division. No one was surprised. Five years later, those kids come into sixth grade. They test very poorly in math. By the end of sixth grade, they test higher than the kids who had had math all the way until sixth grade. In one year, they more than made up for five years of missed mathematics. I'm going to skip this great thing in Finland. They don't start school until they're seven years old. Do we really need to be taking tests to get on the waiting list for pre-kindergarten programs? So it is time to start doing less. And by doing less, let children do more. Take more responsibility and take on more challenging problems. We can stop those harmful grading practices and we can stop assigning homework, but we shouldn't stop there. We should start measuring how engaged children are at school instead of how well they do at tests. And we should have more aha moments and fewer oh no moments. So let us be brave. Let us seek out educational diversity and demand change in our schools. 
An intellectual, educational monoculture exhibits the same kinds of vulnerabilities that an ecological monoculture does. We are squandering a national, if not global, resource by teaching kids how to take tests instead of nurturing their lifelong love of learning. Because we don't need people with good grades anymore. We need voracious, self-directed learners who see the tough problems as puzzles and have the creative capacity to solve them. Thank you so much.